I have a question for you this morning. What if you, were thought, you thought you were working for God, but you come to find out you're actually working against God? <laughs> what if? And you're probably thinking, like, like, wouldn't I know that? Like, wouldn't that be really apparent? Well, apparently it wasn't apparent to one of the most famous figures in world history. You know him as Paul the Apostle, uh, also known as Saul. His Hebrew name is Saul. His Greek name is Paul. Same guy. And he just uh, began to refer to himself as Paul as he ministered more to, uh, more to a Greek audience. So same guy we talk about Saul and Paul. But anyway, Paul spent years thinking he was knocking it out of the park for God. Like just working, like the most committed person ever to walk the earth for God. He thought that. Well, he had a pivotal moment in his life where he found out that wasn't the case. And not only was he not working for God, he was actually working like against God. And um, today we're going to look at that pivotal time in Paul's life where he realized he wasn't working for God and he was actually working against God, that pivotal moment. And, and we'll look at this like, so what happened to Paul? that turned him around, and 180 degrees would be an, an understatement. Um, and you're going to learn today what that pivotal moment was, but more importantly, like how you can have a turnaround in your life. You know, maybe, maybe you, like, think things are, like, you're going the right direction, or maybe you know you're not, but, like, how do you, how do you know, how do you know? you're on the right path. How do you know you're doing what God wants you to do? You're gonna, we're going to learn that today as we look at this, this story about Paul. It's all part of our uh, Bible engagement project. We were preaching clear through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation this, this year or these months. And we'll be, uh, right now we're in the book of Acts. We'll be, we've, we're there for a couple weeks and, and, and there for a couple more weeks. And on June 2nd, we'll end with, with Revelation. But we're in the book of Acts now, so if you have your Bible, you can turn to Acts 9. We also have it up on the screen for you, and we also have uh, online notes. So your your uh, bulletin tells you how to get to our online notes through our app or through our website, and all the, the verses are there as well, and the points. So let's look at this life of Paul or Saul. He was a Pharisee. Uh, he was extremely educated in the Scriptures. Like, Paul knew... The Bible at that time, uh, which would be basically, you know, Genesis through, what, Malachi? <laughs> uh, um, yeah. And he knew that, front to back and back to front. Um, he was a Jew, devout Jew, but he didn't believe the claims of Jesus. All right? So he had, uh, in fact, not only did he not believe the claims of Jesus, but with the blessing of Jewish leaders, he was imprisoning and killing Christians. That's what he was doing. As a, a Jewish person, wholly committed to God, at least in his mind, killing and imprisoning Christians. Now, they weren't called Christians at that time. It, they, uh, Christians got that label several years later, I believe in Antioch, they started calling them cr Christians, or Christ you know, followers of Christ, Christians. Um, but before that, they just started calling them the way. And I'm not sure where that came from, but I, I have a lot, a lot of guesses. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he always talked about showing the way, and this is the way to the Father. Maybe that's probably where that came from, but they just started calling them the way, all right? Paul didn't like people from the way. To him, they were heretics, and they deserve to be, like, taken off the planet, doing God's work. <laughs> so, Acts 9, starting in verse 1, we're going to kind of work through this and talk about it as we go. Here we go. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Yeah, or kill them. <laughs> Again, Saul thought he was doing God's work. He thought he was like 
just, again, knocking it out of the park by imprisoning these followers of Jesus and even killing them. Stephen was one of them. Um, Paul was extremely religious. He was also extremely wrong. And a lot of times we just think, well, if it's, if it's religious, it has to be right. If it's religious, it has to be good. Actually, you look at the Bible, it's the opposite. Usually. If it's religious, it's usually not good. Usually. Because religion is such a man-made uh, thing. We'll, we'll talk about that in, in just a minute. But let me just, let me just lay out the main point here so we, we can kind of work from there. Here's the main point. Commitment to God without an encounter with Jesus leads to empty religion. That's where Paul was. I mean, he was, when I say empty religion, he was, he was full of religion, full of it. But the religion was empty because it was devoid of Jesus Christ and an encounter with him. Um, <laughs> Jesus talked about guys like Paul. And, and he said this, uh, talking to the Pharisees, this is recorded in John chapter 5, starting in verse 39. Jesus is talking to these Pharisees. He says, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. So he's saying this like, you know the scriptures, you know them almost by heart, and they point to me, which it does. If you look at, at the Old Testament, there, Jesus is all over it. I mean, his name, Jesus, isn't there, but Messiah, I mean, it's all there. And there are many people in the Old Testament that are listed in, well, in one place is Hebrews 11. All these people who believed in the Messiah to come, they believed in Jesus before Jesus was even on the earth because the, the scriptures told them, right? And God spoke to them about that. But there were so many religious, educated people that missed that. And even when Jesus was right there, they, they missed it. It's like, you're looking for me, and here I am, but you're not seeing me. That's, that's empty religion. Empty religion opposes God's principles. It's because religion is so much about doing things man's way. <laughs> like, so many man-made things creep into religion. And pretty soon it doesn't even look like what Jesus intended. An empty religion, like Paul was involved in, very religiously, is dangerous. Because it forces the will of man onto others in the name of God. It's like, in the name of God, we're doing this. It's like, uh, I don't think God would like do that. Like, would God kill people that Jesus died for and those people were serving him? Would he, like, no, probably not, but they didn't see that. That's why it can be so dangerous. Paul was caught up in that. That's not, but that's not where Paul stayed. It's not the end of the story. So, here we go, Acts 9, verse 3. We're still in the story. He's headed to Damascus. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? When he says Lord, he just knew it was somebody bigger than him. He didn't know it was Jesus. Saul asked, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. We're going to continue on, but I've heard people say, you know, because they know kind of generally the story of the Damascus Road experience where Paul, Saul, who was Paul, Saul got knocked to the ground and Jesus spoke to him. I've heard people say, man, I, would, I need a Damascus Road experience. I want a Damascus Road experience. No, you don't. <laughs> you, you want to be knocked to the ground by God because you're not paying attention? 
I mean, I've, I've felt a little bit like that sometimes. I've never been knocked to the ground. If you have a Damascus Road experience, it's because you're so far out of God's plan that he has to like hit you with a two by four, knock you down, get your attention. So if, if you need a Damascus Road experience, you could get one. But I'm telling you, it, it's not something you should seek in, in that sense. Like, I'm so, far out of, I'm so far out of God's will that he had to knock me down and get my attention. Now, now that being said, there are times when God wants to encounter us, Jesus wants to encounter us and, and get us on the right path and kind of, sh- kind of sh- shift our trajectory a little bit. That's good, and that's happened in my life. It's probably happened in your life. That's a good thing, and I guess that would be a form of a Dam- Damascus Road experience. It's just that it didn't knock you down, and maybe you weren't killing Christians, but it helped you get back on the right path. So there is a good aspect to that. So... Um, as we kind of work through this, here's point number one. Jesus wants you to encounter him. He wants that. He loves when you, when you encounter him. He loves when you come into your presence, uh, you come into his presence. And you're like, what, can you even do that? Like, I thought he's in heaven and we're down here. We'll talk more about that, but yes, in the spirit, you, you can come into his presence. Um, but he wants to encounter you, and he wants to have, I guess, sort of a hopefully kind and gentle Damascus Road experience with you. I've had a few of those. Probably the most noteworthy one, as I, as I think about it, was Wednesday, January 26th of the year 2000, just past Y2K. I remember that date for two reasons. Uh, it was my brother's birthday who had passed away, but that's his birthday, January 26th. But it was a Wednesday before Super Bowl. <laughs> and uh, we, we were living in Fairfield, uh, just a, a block north of Main Street. We had a business here. We had the Fairfield Times. My wife had an insurance business. And I'm, I'm walking to work one morning, about 7.30 in the morning, on January 26th. And I just, I'm going to go down and go in the back door of our office. So I go down the alley behind the grocery store. And as soon as I turn, I'm right by the dumpster. I just remember this like it was yesterday. And... Um, it just all of a sudden, I just, this voice, not audible, but in my heart, like just this thought came so, I don't know, hard, it didn't knock me down, but it said, I want you to be a pastor, because I, I subconsciously, I'd been pushing that off for all my life, because like, wrong guy, I have no desire to do that, I'm not holy enough, I can't, in fact, I said, when I heard that voice, I knew who it was, and I'm like, I can't preach like Pastor Joe. He was my pastor. Uh, we were attending in Shoto, New Song Church at the time. And he goes, just like that, he said, if you'll be humble and obedient, your sermons will be powerful. Okay. I know who you are, <laughs> and I know what you're asking. And no disrespect, but I'm going to need some confirmation. Because that was like... <laughs> I mean, I knew who he was, but like, this is crazy, because this is not something I'm like pursuing. <laughs> but God was pursuing me, so I, I'll tell you more about the confirmation in a minute, because that's, that's really interesting. But I want to continue on in this story. So here we are, Saul, who's been imprisoning and killing followers of Jesus, is going to Damascus, Syria, which is still a city, by the way, and he's going to find Christians there, and bring them to Jerusalem and imprison them. And he'll probably kill a few on the way. God, uh, Jesus crosses, crosses paths with them, knocks him down on, his, on the ground, and says, Saul, I have a plan for you. Go to Damascus. So we'll keep reading there. So here, here's where we pick up the story. They take him to Damascus. He's blind. Acts chapter 9, verse 10. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he's done to your holy people in, Israel, in Jerusalem. 
And he has come here with the authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. So Jesus now goes to one of his followers, Ananias, and says, Ananias, I want you to go to your greatest enemy. <laughs> I want you to go see this. I want you to go minister to this guy. And Ananias is like, I know that guy. We all know of him. He's the one that kills us and imprisons us. Like, so you're saying you want me to go minister to him? Yeah, I do. He has a choice, right? I mean, I'd be like, I'm not sure. But, but he did. So, chapter, uh, verse 17. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. If it hadn't been for Ananias, I'm not sure we would know who Paul is. I mean, maybe. I mean, God has a way of working things out. But Ananias played a huge role in getting Paul to where God wanted him. God had a big thing for Paul, and Ananias was part of that big thing, helping him get there. That was Ananias' big thing. God's big thing for you might be you helping someone else get to their big thing. That might be your thing, helping other people get to their thing. Like, play the role of Ananias. And sometimes we, we don't see that. But So this is point number two this morning. Jesus wants to use you in his encounters with other people. God is speaking to you through the Holy Spirit on how he wants you to help other people to get them to a place he wants to get them to. It's one of the reasons we have the gifts of the Spirit, as outlined in 1 Corinthians 12. And I've taught this before many times. Most times, we're not the recipient of the gift. We're the, we're the delivery person of the gift. In other words, gift of wisdom, gift of knowledge, gift of prophecy, gift of miracles, gift of faith, so many of those, it might be for us, but usually it's for somebody else. And, and, and the Holy Spirit gifts us so that we can go to that person and by either a prophetic word, a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge, or, or whatever it is, that person go like, oh, man, that is God, okay. And they, and they get on the right path. That's, that's an important role for believers. So let me continue in, in my story of confirmation after... God called me to be a pastor. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to need some confirmation. I will tell you this. I'm not going to tell you all the confirmation because it would take a long time. It, it, I had got so much confirmation, I, it almost got laughable. I was like, you can stop now. I got it. But the first one was amazing. So I'm like, this is like, I got, for three days I didn't say anything because I'm like, I'm not saying a word until, I don't know. I just got to wrestle with this. First person I talked to was my pastor, and uh, he said, I said, you better sit down, this is weird. God called me to be a pastor. And he goes, I know. I'm like, what? He said, I, I know, God told me that quite a while ago. Why didn't you tell me? He said, well, you need to hear it from God. See, sometimes we know things that we're not supposed to share, <laughs> but we'll be a part of it later. Sometimes we're supposed to share those things. So anyway, I'm like, I'm not... Honestly, Pastor Joe, I'm afraid to tell my wife because <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if she's going to be there. 
And I know if I'm going to be a pastor, I need to have my wife on board. He goes, well, if God called you, he'll make it clear to her. So I tell her, and she said, oh, I've always seen this in you, Mike. I know you'll make a great pastor. I've always seen this in you. This is a great day. She did not say that. (laughs) She said one word with a question mark. You? (laughs) I know, right? (laughs) I I don't know. She goes, okay, I don't know. That seems kind of weird, but you? Anyway, day or two later, we're both in our office. We have the same phone line there. That's back in the days of landline. I get a call from my brother-in-law. He's since passed away. In fact, he was in Pastor Norm's church in Helena, Randy, for several years. Randy uh, was my wife, my wife, my sister's second husband, godly guy. He wasn't godly growing up. He, he was a wreck growing up, but he, he had an encounter with Jesus, changed the trajectory of his life, changed his life, and married to my sister, and just a very godly guy who, who heard from God. And it just I really liked him, and my wife, really liked Randy too. She really liked him and trusted him. So we get a phone call at work. I go, hello? He goes, it's, it's Randy. I, um, it, it's, uh, I go, Randy, what's going on? I, I'm supposed to, I, I'm just your stupid brother-in-law. I don't, I'm like, Randy, spit it out. He goes, God told me to call you and tell you you're supposed to do it. And I was quiet. And he goes, oh, I'm sorry, I don't know, I just, that's so stupid. I go, Randy, it's not stupid. God told you to call me and tell me that because there's a big life-changing moment that he's asked me to do. And you're part of that confirmation. And then the next thing I said is, Donna, you need to talk to Randy on the phone. <laughs> so she picked up the phone and he told her the same thing. And she's like, well, like, I guess so. And so there was more confirmation. One, I just want one more quick one. I just, because I think this is important. Um, one of the, the pastors that Donna had growing up, Pastor Paul Goodman, Helena First Assembly. Um, so I, when I went to school, college in Helena, I started going to First Assembly and he was the pastor. That's where I met Donna. And he actually did our marriage ceremony. Great pastor, love him. Still, he's still alive. I think he's mid 80s now. Uh, retired, Um, but in this time of confirmation, when nobody knew except Pastor Joe and my wife, well, and then by Randy, but nobody else knew, just a day or two later, we're at a men's conference, statewide men's conference, and there was a prayer time up front, and so I went up for prayer. Pastor Goodman was one of the prayer people, and I didn't say anything about, I just came up and just said, pray for me, and he just started kind of saying a nice prayer, oh, God bless Mike and Donna. And, and then he just, it kind of shifted. And I don't even think he knew it was shifting. He began to speak prophetically to me, and I don't even know if he knew it. And he began to just speak things that were in my heart about ministry that I knew were there, but I didn't really want to think about. And he, one of the things he said, I'll never forget this, he said, and oh God, that you would empower Mike through your Holy Spirit to minister to those standing in the shadows of the church. And that was still my heart. Standing in the shadows of the church means I've just always, always, always had a heart for people who either left church because of hurts or (laughs) being bored or whatever, or people who, and and they weren't back in church, but they kind of wanted to be, but they didn't want to be, or people who just never really have connected with church, but kind of wanted to see what that all about. That's that's really where my heart is, and especially was then. And he, he called it out. I mean, like, to the T. And he said some other things, too. And I'm like, I didn't say anything to him. I'm just like, whoa, okay, that's a confirmation. So I I didn't say anything to Pastor Goodman for years. And just this last fall, we were selling my mom's car. So I put it online. Why I I get a message from Paul Goodman Jr., his son. He goes, hey, I want to buy this car for my daughter to go to college. And so they drove over from Helena to look at, they ended up buying it. But his dad came with him, Pastor Goodman. And I said, oh, Pastor Goodman, so good to see you, and we talked. I said, I need to tell you this. You you were pivotal in me actually taking the step into ministry. He's kind of like, what? 
And I, I told him the story. Of course, he didn't have any recollection of it because he didn't, it wasn't like, I'm now going to speak prophetically to Mike. <laughs> it just, it just kind of came out. And it's like, he, of course, he wouldn't remember that probably. But as I explained that to him and how pivotal that was in my life, I just a tear come down on his cheek. <laughs> I, just, it, I could tell it just ministered to him. And uh, so it's important that you are used by God to help other people get to where they are. But it's also important if somebody has done that in your life, that you let them know that. Because it just, it just ministers back to them. And if you have an Ananias in your life, just let them know how God has used them because they probably don't know. And uh, yeah, so. All right, back to where we are. Um, when you pray for people and speak prophetically into their life, you could be very well be unleashing God's call on their life or giving them the breakthrough they needed. Maybe they're not called to something specific, but they just need a breakthrough in their life. And, and how you pray for them and what you say to them could unleash something that just helps them get to that point. Paul's Damascus Road experience would not have been complete without that Ananias moment. Um, so God may very well have an Ananias moment in your future. <laughs> maybe, your, maybe your near future. How will you respond? I mean, will you shy away because of fear? Like, hmm, not me. You need to decide now how you're going to respond. You need to decide, like, if God's going to use me in that way, I'm going to do it. Because in the moment when it comes, if you're undecided, you're probably going to not do it. How do I know that? Because I've done it. I've shied away of speaking what God wanted me to speak. It's like, that seems kind of weird. And I don't know if it's true. I don't know. So I, I've done that. But I've decided I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to humbly, like, I feel like God's saying this, and you can take it or leave it, but I feel like blah, 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 say it. And they can take it or leave it, but often if it's God, when it is God, they're like, oh, no, you nailed it. Like, I did? Okay. <laughs> um, you, need to, you need to decide right now that, that you're going to actually do that. Let's get back to our story. So Paul has had, the, had this encounter with Jesus, he gets blinded, they lead him into Damascus, Ananias comes uh, at the call of the Lord, lays hands on him, he's filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, and now we pick up the story, verse 20, Acts 9. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. Paul didn't take time licking his wounds and playing a victim or uh, he didn't, also did not wallow in guilt and shame. <laughs> That's probably what I would have done. Like, Oh my word, I've killed and imprisoned so many innocent people, right? You could just, that could bring on a lot of guilt and shame, but Paul was free of that and he just was ministering. And it says here that he, uh, he baffled the Jews by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. And I was reading that, I was like, well, how do you prove Jesus is the Messiah? And actually his answer, the answer to that is in the Bible. Imagine that. Paul tells us years later how he convinced people that Jesus was the Messiah. It's several places in the Bible, actually, but here's one. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4. He says, My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but God's power. Paul's saying is, like, I didn't, I didn't persuade him just with words, although he did preach. 
He's saying what, what really brought them to, to accepting the Messiah, Jesus as Messiah, is a demonstration of power, like supernatural power working in and through Paul. People were like, ooh, he must be right because that's crazy. <laughs> that's, wow, signs and wonders. We talk about that a lot. So here's point number three. Encounters with Jesus and empowerment by the Holy Spirit are the key to living with purpose and power. Let me say that again as you're writing that down. Encounters with Jesus and empowerment by the Holy Spirit are the key to living with purpose and power. Paul, or Jesus encountered Paul to change his purpose. And then he sent him to Ananias to be filled with the Holy Spirit. He was giving Paul purpose and power. Jesus wants to encounter you so that you can know your purpose. And he wants to fill you with the Holy Spirit so that you can carry out your purpose with power. We're going to take a few minutes. This is a, a little different, but I think, I, think, I think Jesus really wants this, all right? So I think we're going, we're going to do this. If you're not going to be embarrassed, don't, don't worry. <laughs> but it is a little different. We're going to take a few minutes, and I really want to encounter, uh, uh, facilitate an encounter with Jesus. Now, our whole worship time is actually for that, encountering, encountering Jesus through worship. So that's not, so we do that, but... I want, to, I want to maybe go just a little bit further in that, and, and I, want to help you, I want to help you hear from Jesus, because I know he wants to speak to you. See, later in Paul's ministry, he prayed a prayer for all believers. So this includes you. So Paul actually prayed for you as a believer. And here's just one line from his, from his prayer. Is found in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17. It says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Why? So that you may know him better. And that doesn't look like a big deal until you understand what the word know means. In the original Greek language, the word know is epignosis, and it means to know by experience as opposed to just knowing information. Paul had lots of information. Paul, when he was going against God, had more information than probably almost anybody on the planet. But that information didn't transform him. It wasn't until he had an encounter with Jesus that he was really transformed, that he experienced Jesus. When you, ha when you have an experience, it will change you. Now, I should say this. You don't base your beliefs off experience, but you should experience your beliefs. Right? There's a lot of people that have beliefs, but it's just information. They're not experiencing those beliefs. And so we, under, we understand the Bible. We understand the truth of the Bible. Have you experienced that? Not just know it. I mean, it's good to know it, but you need to experience it. And so many Christians struggle to live a transformed life because they're operating solely on information. Got lots of information, but there's not a lot of transformation because they haven't experienced God in a real, in a real way. That can and does happen. It's a Damascus Road experience of different sorts for everybody where, where Jesus encounters you and he speaks to you so that you can know your purpose and be filled with the Holy Spirit to, to walk that out in power. Jesus says this in, in John 10:27. This is Jesus speaking. He says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. And then he goes even further in John 14, 21. He says, the one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. It's like, what? That's just a, a metaphor. 
<laughs> no, it's not. I've never seen Jesus physically, <laughs> like with my eyes, like light rays bouncing to my eyes, like there's Jesus. You, you haven't seen that either, but I've seen Jesus. Our soul, that invisible part of us, mind, will, intellect, emotions, operates in this physical world through our body, right? We smell things, see things, hear things, all that stuff, right? Our soul also can see things in the spirit, through our spirit, hear things through our spirit. It's not sound waves coming into our ears, not light waves. It's just these impressions, these things we see. And a lot of times we chalk it up to like either daydreaming or your own thoughts. And certainly you can have that. But God speaks to your conscience. And a lot of time when Jesus speaks to you, it sounds like you. <laughs> because he's speaking to your conscience. Like, oh, that was just me thinking. Like, well, no. <laughs> the more you hear from from Jesus, the more you recognize him. It just, and sometimes it's, it's a word or a phrase or a, a mental image. Sometimes he shows us things. There's, there's such a thing, I think people kind of refer to it as a holy imagination. Like, well, that doesn't sound biblical. Well, that's where visions come from. Paul, uh, Ananias got his instructions from Jesus from a vision. He saw something. God wants to show you, in fact, Joel 2.28, I don't have that because I'm just winging it right now, but Joel 2.28 says, in the, in the last days, um, God will pour out his spirit on your sons and daughters. Your young men will see visions and, and your old men will dream dreams. God and your daughters will prophesy. So women, you're included in this. Uh, God wants to show you stuff. He wants to tell you things. He wants you to encounter him. Maybe it's to bring breakthrough in your life. Maybe it's to get you on, a, on the right path. Maybe it's just to encourage you. I don't know. There's so, there's so many ways he wants to do that. I just know that from Jesus' own words, he wants to do that. So if you would just like, you don't have to get out of your seat. You don't have to do anything embarrassing. But I do want to... I do want to get you a little bit out of your comfort zone. And I want to help kind of facilitate you um, to hear from Jesus. Right? So I'm going to, Caleb, would you, like, would you just like bring the house lights like way down? I don't want to get weird, but I just want to give some privacy. So he's going to bring the house lights like down and give you some privacy. And I want you to close your eyes. This is just going to take a couple minutes. So don't, don't fret. This is, we're, we're getting close here. But I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to turn your thoughts from the natural to the spiritual. Your soul has been so used to operating in the natural, you need to almost really purpose, like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn to the spiritual things now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to look there. And as you do that, I want you, to, I want you to begin to picture Jesus in your mind. You're like, well, I don't know what Jesus looks like. Well, <laughs> just if maybe you've seen a picture of what you think he looks like. It doesn't really matter. But just look for him in the spirit. Look to him. Maybe it's a familiar image, whatever it is. And as you see that in your spirit, I just want you, and in your soul, I just want you to walk up to him. Sometimes it's easier if we ask Jesus a question and then wait for an answer. So I'm going to give you a question to ask Jesus. And listen for that still, small voice. It's probably going to sound a lot like your voice. It might be an impression. It might be a, a mental image. But ask Jesus this. Really tune into him and ask him this. Jesus, what is something you like about me? Just ask him that. Jesus, what is something you like about me?
really tune into him, really look to him, here's another question you could ask. Jesus, what do you know about me that I don't know about me? All right, asking that question, Jesus, what do you know about me that I don't know about me? Ask him that. I think he wants to answer that. And then one last question you could ask is, is this, Jesus, is there anything else you want to show me or tell me? Again, really press in and ask him, Jesus, is there anything else that you would want to show me or tell me? Worship team's up front. I'm going to ask Pastor Norm to come on up and join me up here. I'm going to bring the lights up just a little bit. We're going to close in a time of worship. It's a time where you can continue to encounter Jesus, where your heart's open and you're receiving from him and you're giving him praise and worship and he's speaking to you. We want to continue to do that. Um, but as we do that, Norm and I, we're going to be your Ananias today. <laughs> If you, if you just want more of the Holy Spirit's power, maybe you don't, never had, don't have that, you want baptism of the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit, we're gonna just lay a hand on you and pray that for you. So we're gonna, we're gonna be your Ananias today, all right? So if you wanna come up as we worship, we're gonna just lay a quick hand on you and pray that the Holy Spirit would just pour his presence into you and empower you like never before so that you can carry out Jesus' purpose for you with power. So why don't you stand if you're physically able. We're going to close in this time of worship, and if you want to come up and, and have Norm and I lay a hand on you, come on up as we worship. <laughs> 